we enjoy uh, organizing and debating the greatest lists of things. There's all sorts of specials, like YouTube channel videos all the time, uh, different uh, TV show uh, lists and movie lists and book lists and song lists. There's all sorts of things. You can find them. Part of the fun is disagreeing uh, with and arguing uh, about them. Uh, there's a YouTube channel called Cinefex that, that does sort of a, a highfalutin version of it. And Nicole and I like to uh, listen to their list of the best westerns and the best sci-fi movies and, and go back and forth on whether or not we agree. And of course, if you were in my shoes uh, when you're trying to decide on the best movie, the real question is just, is it Lord of the Rings or Star Wars? I mean, come on, which one is it? Uh, they both speak to me on a fundamental level. Uh, if it was the best song of the 1980s, Kathy knows where I'm going here, VH1 declared Living on a Prayer the best song of the 80s. Uh, unfortunately, in my life, I listen to Let It Go more than that these days. Uh, but uh, you, could art, you could debate the classic 8-bit Nintendo, what's the best game, in which case the answer is either the original Mario Brothers or Legend of Zelda, and I'm not listening to anyone else saying anything else. Just this past Tuesday, I found myself in a car with Dan and Will on the, back, on the way back from the Pirates game, stuck in a traffic jam that lasted an hour. And so what did we talk about? Well, of course, being the nerds that we were, Will and I talked about the top fantasy football seasons of all time, because ESPN's app had a list. Uh, and so we uh, looked at that and we're talking about that. That helped us pass the time while we looked at taillights and, and waited and waited and waited. There's some enjoyment to this. And of course, today is opening uh, season day. Uh, obviously, there was a game Thursday for the NFL. Uh, and fans around here are going to be arguing about who's going to be the best in the AFC North. Not Pittsburgh this year. Uh, maybe, but probably not. Uh, if you want to argue about the best sports team of all time, I will take any answer except for Alabama and college football and the Patriots in the NFL, because neither one of those answers can I live with. Uh, they, whether or not they're true, uh, it's just not acceptable. So we know about such things. And interestingly enough, in the Gospel of Mark this morning, there is a discussion about what is the greatest. What do you know? Verse 28 one of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating, noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer. He asked him, of all the commandments, which is the most important? Now, the rabbis had spent some time looking at Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and trying to calculate how many commandments there actually are, right? Because some of them are redundant. They're repeated, uh, and they overlap and whatnot. Their answer was ultimately 613 commandments, of which 365 were negative. Don't do such and such. 248 were positive. This is what you must do. But that's a lot. 613. Trying to keep track of that, trying to remember all of that. And so this is a valid and important question. And the questioner in this episode is actually sincere. Previously, the people coming to Jesus with questions were people trying to trip him up, trying to uh, make a fool of him, trying to get him in trouble with the law. This man's actually sincere. It's nice for a change. And actually, the rabbis and the leaders of Judaism have been talking about this question for centuries. So it's not a new question. In fact, Rabbi Hillel, one of the two most influential rabbis in the period leading up to Jesus, along with Gamaliel, Hillel, who died about 10 AD, so he's been dead for a couple of decades when this question is asked, he was once asked by a Gentile, a, a, a non-Jew, came up to him and said, make me a proselyte, which means a, a convert to Judaism, on condition that you teach me the whole law while I stand on one foot. In other words, he said, I'd be all for your religion if it wasn't so complicated. If there wasn't so much to it, I'll stand on one foot. And I don't know how long you're going to stand on one foot. A few minutes, right? He's like, 
if you can't tell me what your religion's all about and what I need to know in just a couple of minutes, I'm not interested. I would, I'm sure some people would agree with that sentiment and, and have. Here's the response. What you hate for yourself, do not do to your neighbor. This is the whole law. The rest is commentary, so go and learn. You recognize that, right? Jesus echoes that uh, in his own way. Uh, that's the negative. He echoes the positive. But we appreciate when things are summed up, especially long and complicated things. We like the Reader's Digest version or, academically, the Cliff Notes. What would you rather re read? Shakespeare's Henry V or the Cliff Notes, right? Macbeth or the Cliff Notes? Some of you can't remember the trauma of reading Shakespeare in high school, but others of you are still remembering that. You much preferred the Cliff Notes, right? Whether your teacher allowed you to or not, that was something that made it so much easier. Well, religion and ethics, which is of course related to religion, could benefit from memorable phrases, from having the whole business summed up so that we can more, easier, more easily apply it to the day-to-day. -day. We need to know what does this faith, what does this religion teach us at work, with our family, uh, with money, with all, you know, just in general, give us some direction so that we can figure things out. Because it can be easy. Or excuse me, because it can be complicated and, and long. Well, of course, the challenge when you're trying to sum up is that you need to make sure you hit the essence. You don't want to take away something that is essential when you sum up. And you don't want to miss something. You don't want to leave out things, but you want to keep it short. It's not easy. Well, here's Jesus' response. We'll see. By the way, the right-hand side is the Hebrew. Uh, it starts here and goes that way. Uh, the Hebrew of the text that Jesus is going to quote from Deuteronomy that we already read this morning, in case you were sitting there wondering what on earth that was. Verse 29, the most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. This answer from Jesus is not controversial in the least. The text, Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5, known to Jews as the Shema which is the first word in that phrase. It means hear or listen up. In their services, in prayer services in the synagogue, they typically quoted that, plus verses 6 to 9, and chapter 11, 13 to 21, and Numbers 15, 37 to 41. In other words, about a dozen verses were recited regularly in synagogue services, all of them revolving around that same theme of loving God and serving him. Since the time of the second temple, we don't have any evidence before this, we don't know, but at least since the time of the second temple with Ezra and Nehemiah, that era, that era about 600 years before Jesus, pious Jews had been reciting the brief uh, words of the Shema, verses just four and five, every morning and every night. When you get up in the morning, you recite it. When you lay your head down to go to sleep, you recite it. Actually, if you've been watching The Chosen, that miniseries, which I recommend, they, they do that often. You'll hear them saying it, uh, not in English, they actually have the characters saying it in Hebrew uh, uh, when they get up in the morning. It's, to us, akin to the Lord's Prayer, right? The Lord's Prayer is something we recite on a regular basis. Many of us use it as a daily or regular prayer. Uh, it's that familiar. It was that widespread in its use in Jesus' day. That actual phrase, the actual beginning of that is Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Now, you heard Adonai in there twice, right? Adonai is not in the original text because the original text is yod heh vav -He, the sacred name of God. And so when the Jews said it out loud, when they read it or when they recited it, they only said Adonai. They knew what it meant, but they did not want to use the name of the Lord in vain, so they didn't ever use it. 
So if you ever hear that, if you see it in a movie, if you hear someone saying it, that's the Shema. That's what they are reciting. What is the key teaching of these two verses that Jesus says is the greatest commandment? Well, number one, there's only one God. Secondly, our commitment to that God is total. Now, that's pretty straightforward, right? That's summing it up. There's one God and you owe him everything. Case closed. Didn't need, need to be uh, expounded upon too much. What that does is preclude divided loyalties. It keeps us from having competing allegiances. And it also precludes lukewarm devotion and what we call compartmentalization of our lives. I think you know what compartmentalization means. That means you act like a Christian here on Sunday, but at work you don't. Or with your family you don't. Or with your friends you don't. You have different pieces to your life that are not together. This text tells us that's not going to work. Because God and God alone requires all of all of us. Now, that's not the answer that a lot of people want to hear about religion, right? They'd much rather modify that and say, there's either more than one thing that I can pursue. They don't like that God is one part. Or they would rather do it on kind of a take-it-easy basis. But that option is not on the menu. This is a take-it-or-leave-it proposition. This is not a buffet. Either there is one God and you serve him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, or you're not obeying the greatest commandment. So with all the controversies and all the debates amongst the rabbinical schools, this answer has common ground. Jesus is not upsetting anyone by saying this. Now, in the Gospels, Jesus often overturns conventional wisdom, right? Flies right in the face of what everybody thought was true. Because what everybody thought was true was often wrong. But in this case, he is reinforcing a common understanding. This goes back to Moses. It's been the commandment of the people of God for 1,500 years. And he says, that's the right track. Don't change it. But he continues, because he was asked about the greatest commandment, which is the most important one. But Jesus says, ah, we can't stop there. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There's no commandment greater than these. Jesus could have left it at number one, right? Obeying, that's hard enough, isn't it? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Isn't that enough? The history of the people of Israel, as you read the Old Testament, is a battle between the priests and the prophets of God trying to get the people to commit fully to monotheism, trying to get them to say, no, there's only one God, not Baal, not Ashtaroth, not Asherah, not any of that, just one. And trying to get them to stop using idols. You see that over and over and over again in the Old Testament. So yeah, they had an issue with just getting this down. So an emphasis on devotion to God alone, with a thorough commitment of heart, mind, body, and strength, that's a worthy and wise answer. That will keep you busy your whole life long, will it not? But Jesus chooses to go a step further. To him, there is a second commandment that is inextricably tied to the first. And the reason is simple. The reason is explained to us in good detail by the Apostle John in his letter. In 1 John, it's actually chapter 4, 20 and 21. John will draw the connection between loving God and loving man. He says this, whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. To whoever for whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen, cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he's given us this command, anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. Yeah, so John says, don't tell me that you love God but hate people. That isn't going to work. Because people you know, 
people you see, people you interact with. If you can't love them, then don't tell me you love God. Loving our neighbor is the practical way in which we demonstrate that our claim to love God is real. We'd better understand and accept what loving our neighbor means then, should we not? So let's think about that. First question that comes to mind and one that Jesus will be asked in the Gospels is, who is my neighbor? Right? If I have to love my neighbor as myself, I better get a definition. And definitions are helpful. Well, unfortunately for us, on multiple occasions, Jesus resisted attempts to narrow the definition of neighbor. Maybe we don't have to include the Gentiles. Maybe we don't have to include our enemies. Maybe we don't have to include etc., etc. Instead, Jesus actively broadens the definition of neighbor. Long story short, any fellow human being you interact with in life counts as your neighbor. Every interaction you have with anyone else is thus subject to the command of loving your neighbor as yourself. There's no exceptions, no exclusions, not even your enemies, your boss, your relatives, or might I add, even the people that think Phantom Menace, Menace is the best Star Wars movie, even them we have to love as ourselves. That's an inside nerd joke. If you don't get it, don't worry about it. Uh, I can't help them, but I need to love them. Second question. Okay, neighbors everybody. Maybe we can find some wiggle room on the as yourself thing. That sounds pretty funky. Boy, maybe we got some room there, right? Perhaps the type of love that we're commanded to give, it's not that burdensome. It won't actually cost us much of anything. Well, no such luck. To love as yourself is to treat them with as much care and concern as you treat yourself. Side note, maybe you're not treating yourself with good care and concern, and that's a different issue, but that's a serious problem and one uh, we can help you with. But obviously you're supposed to care about yourself. We all spend a significant amount of our energy and time and resources on our own needs and wants, do we not? If we don't treat our obligation to other people as likewise a primary concern, worthy of significant attention and sacrifice, we will fail to live up to this very high standard. Now obviously you cannot give every person you meet in life the same amount of time and attention that you give yourself, because there's just one of you. But you need to look on the person who is hungry, and the person who is homeless, and the person who is hurting, as if it is your pain. Perhaps even Jesus said something about doing to the least of these. Maybe we heard that too. When Jesus talks about visiting and helping the sick and the homeless and the hungry, he is putting this command into practical application so that people can see what it costs. So taken together, a full devotion to God alone and a consistent and costly love for those around us is the essence of what God placed us on this earth to do. The rest of our ethical obligations fall under one of those two categories. They're either an example of you loving God or loving your neighbor. That is the beating heart of what, our being, of, of what being a Christian is all about. People who think otherwise are mistaken. Being a Christian is about love vertically with God and horizontally with each other. So if someone wants you to sum up, what is Christianity? What is your faith? Loving God and loving my neighbor. You can do that while they stand on one foot. That's not so hard. Well said, teacher, the man replied. You're right in saying that God is one, and there's no other but him. 
to love him with all your heart and with all your understanding, with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. This unnamed man who asked Jesus which commandment is the greatest concurs. He says, Jesus, your assessment that loving God and loving your neighbor is fitting and proper, that is a good summation of the law. He then adds an observation, his own observation, and this is wise. This is something that the prophets of old, Isaiah and others, had tried to get the people to understand. You can find a number of quotes in the Old Testament that speak to this truth. Love is supreme, even over religious ceremonies, even over religious observances, even over commandments of religious observances because the sacrifices of the law of Moses were required. They were not optional. Doing them was necessary. Yet they are secondary to love. Because without love, they have no value on their own. Without love, you can do all the burnt offerings that you want, and God will not hear you. The Apostle Paul wrote a whole famous chapter about that, did he not, that we often recite at weddings. Paul said, even if I give up my body to the flames, even if I die a martyr, but have not love, I am nothing. The prophet Hosea declared, Hosea 6.6, 6, I desire mercy, not sacrifice an acknowledgement of God rather than offerings. Jesus himself will quote Hosea to the, pro to the Pharisees when they question him about appropriateness of eating with tax collectors and sinners. That took place before this uh, in the text. Matthew 9, 13 is the one where he quotes Hosea. He says, that's why I'm doing it. In the end... Jesus taught in the tradition of the prophets that outward devotion to God, even if you do it the right way, is not only insufficient to please God, but actually insults God, because outward only devotion does not require the top place in our hearts and minds. The way in which we worship and serve God is important. If he tells us to do it a certain way, we should do it that way but always secondary to the devotion of our hearts. And it's always contingent upon the love that we show for others around us to be validated. So yeah, you can come to church every week, you can sing the songs, you can pray, but if you have not love, Jesus says, I got nothing for you. Chapter 34, he probably didn't say nothing, uh, that, that was me. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And from then on, no one dared to ask him any more questions. Whoever this man was, he understood the message of God to his people. For everyone living before the time of Christ, Hebrews 11 makes it clear to us that they were saved by faith, facing toward God's promises of the Messiah. God had said, I will one day do it, and they had faith that God would keep his word. They didn't know what it would look like. Their faith was forward-leaning. This man seems like he belongs in the category of Old Testament saints. He knows what God requires. As someone living during Jesus' earthly ministry, he now has the opportunity to live that faith further by acknowledging Jesus. Mark doesn't tell us the rest of the story. We don't know this man's name or whatever became of him, but he was on the right track. As for the rest of the crowd, this constructive back and forth between Jesus and this man is so impressive that they don't want to try to say anything else. They're thinking, I say anything else after this and it's going to sound stupid, so I will just let it go. So what do we take from this? Let's sum up the summing up, eh? Applications, number one, the most important truth is that there is but one God, and he requires 100% of our devotion. 
pet peeve. He doesn't require 110%. There is no such thing as 110% of your devotion. Uh, that just means you didn't define 100% properly. God requires everything. Secondly, God requires that we demonstrate that devotion by loving others. Thirdly, these two things are more important than anything else done in the name of religion. More important than anything else done in the name of religion.